praise the Lord. Let us pray. We have come again. We have come again. Father, we have come again. Holy Ghost, come and take control. Amen. We have come again. Come again, Father, we have come again. Holy Ghost, come and take. Let's begin to worship the name of God. Let's begin to adore Him for His goodness, His mercies, His loving kindness upon our lives. Let's thank Him because He's a God that never fails, He's a God that never changes, He's unchangeable changes. Is the movable movers. Let's magnify his name. Let's adore his name. Let's praise him because he's the mighty man in battle. Let's thank him for fighting all our battles for us. Let's thank him for victory, for triumphant. He's giving us every minute, every seconds, every hours, every days. Let's worship his name. Father, we thank you. Father, we appreciate you. In the name of Jesus Christ, there is no one like you. There is none to compare with you. Lord, you are so great. Lord, you are so kind. Darling Jesus, we worship you. Thank you for fighting all my battles for me. Thank you, oh God, for destroying the works of darkness over my life. Thank you for making a way where there seems to be no way. Let I praise you and worship your holy name in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Let's appreciate his goodness over our lives for protecting us from the snares of the enemy, from keeping us, from guiding us, for giving us safe journey mercies here and there. Let's exalt his holy name. Let's thank him for providing for all our needs according to his riches and glory. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's appreciate his goodness in our life. Goodness of good health. Goodness of wealth. Goodness of his blessings. Goodness of his heavenly inheritance. Let's appreciate him. Goodness of sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Goodness of knowing him. There are so many people out there that doesn't know him. They know there's a creator, but they don't know him. Bible says, Blessed is the man that have not seen me, but have believed in me. They don't believe in him. Let's thank God for he gave us that grace to know him, to believe in him, to acknowledge him into our lives. Let's worship his name. Let's exalt his holy name. Father, we bless you. Father, we adore your name. Thank you, O oh God, for the goodness of your salvation, of sending Christ to die for me. Thank you for the goodness of acknowledging it, of referencing him in my life, in my family. Lord, I worship your holy name. Thank you, O oh Lord, for making me to believe in you, believe in your word, believe in your revelations. Lord, I appreciate your name. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Let's thank God for making us to worship him, to serve him. Bible says we cannot serve two masters. We can only serve God and leave my money. But let's thank God for serving him. There are some people that are not serving the creator, but they are serving what he has created. 
Some are Buddhas, worshipping the moon, serving the moon, serving the sun. But God did not let us to be part of them. And let's thank God because God will open their eyes of understanding. I was opportune by His grace to preach to a man two days ago and yesterday about Christ. And he was telling me he's a Buddhist. He has read a lot of this, a lot of this prophet, a lot of that prophet. And I was telling him, you can even read the Bible and read it as a novel. But when God opens your eyes of understanding, you will see the difference. You will see that it's not just written by a man. It was written by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this made him to sober. And he told me, I want to know more of God. I want to be able to pray. He said, I want to be able to pray as I'm praying. Let's worship his holy name. I let him know we can appreciate what God has created, but not, not serving that what he has created. Not turning that to be our God. Let's thank him. Because the Bible says we shall not have, thou shall not have any other gods beside the living God. Let's thank him for that grace he gave to us for not serving another God. Another man made God. Some are serving an image. Image that was made by human being. When God has told us to, to dominate what he has created, he put us in charge of those things. Not to be worshipping them. Not to be praising them. But to praise the living God. Let's thank God because he has not allowed you and I to shift our attention from serving him. Let's appreciate his goodness. Let's exalt his name. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, our Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, alone. She won't take Bawala. She won't. She won't take Bawala. She won't. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good, great, oh Lord. You are the mighty man in battle. Father, we exalt your name. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Let's come into the Bible study unto the hands of God, the Father should have his way in our midst. Without him, we can do nothing. Let's we take control, take charge of your lives. That you're coming here today, we've never been in vain. That the Lord will meet you at the point of your needs. That the Lord will open your eyes of understanding to serve the living God and not what he has created. Not to turn what he has created to be your God, to be an idol. Pray that God speak to me this evening. Touch my life. Break every hardened heart in my life. Every worldly attire is in me. That is not letting me to see you as the mighty man in battle. Lord, break those things. Break those barriers. Remove those things from my lives. I want to know you. I want to serve you more. I want to know you more. I want to dedicate my time to you more. I want to dedicate what you have given to me back to you more. I don't want to hold on to them because those things can hinder you from entering the kingdom of God. When you hold on to what he has given unto you more than him, you have turned those things to be an idol. It can be your money. It can be your talents. It can be your academics. This can be your work, but take, give it back to him. Father, we worship your holy name. That you come here this evening, you will speak to us. You will open our eyes of understanding. You will break every barrier, every wall of partition, hindering us from serving you, from surrendering all unto you, from dedicating our time, our talents, our money, 
how our fear is unto you, you will break such wall of partition. In the name of Jesus, you will give us understanding, O God, to see you, O God, as a creator, as the one who has created us, to see you, O God, as a great provider, to see you, O God, as God who can do all in all. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you because you are the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, in Jesus' name, blessed Redeemer, we thank you, we worship your name because you are the Lord. There is none like you, there is none to be compared with you. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, as we have come here today, you will speak to us in Jesus' name. Our lives will never remain the same. In the name of Jesus Christ, that I pray, oh God, is there anything we are holding on to? That we, are t we, 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 take it, we take priority over it more than you. That I pray, oh God, remove that interest of such a thing from our lives in Jesus' name. And give us the interest to know you more. Give us the interest to serve you more. Give us the interest to always acknowledge you in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit has been here to be here today that he visited. Touch them, O oh God. Those on their way, hasten their footsteps and bring them here safely in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, Bible says, we should not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Every power contrary to your will. Every power contrary to our God. Every power contrary, O oh God, from receiving from you. Lord, I paralyze them. I bind them. I cast them out of our lives, out of this arena to the abyss in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit of God, take control. Have your way, O oh God. We don't want to be mature Christian today and baby Christian tomorrow. We don't want to be up and down. We don't want to be lukewarm. Because the Bible says, oh God, neither cold or warm, you will spit out of your mouth. We don't want you to spit us out of your mouth, oh God. But by the grace, oh God, to stand firm, oh God, in any temptations of life, oh God. To know that you are the God who has brought that temptation. Because you are the God in the valley. You are the God in the mountain. To know that God, you that brought that temptation, you can take it away in your own power. Lord, I pray, oh God, help us to see you in a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you because you are the Lord. Cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover this environment with the fire of Holy Ghost. Take control, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Praise the Lord. GHS 20. GHS 20. Thank you. 
prisoner. I welcome everyone of us to today's service and I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, no one among us will go empty and end in Jesus' name. And God is, as God has been visiting us, He will continue to visit us in the name of Jesus Christ. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, our coming will not be in vain. He will touch every one of us in Jesus' name. Once again, I welcome us. Just because of the normal thing, I want to remind us of all our program that by the grace of the Lord we start our Sunday worship service every Sunday from 8.50 to 11.30. Many times we nearly go before 12, but Almighty God will continue to help us in Jesus' name. Our Monday service always start by, by 6.50 and then instead we have extension of Bible study which is usual. Uh, we we're supposed to come to an end by 8.30, but maximum before 9, we leave this place by the grace of the Lord. Do not forget Thursday prayer meeting. I know that without prayer, nothing can be done. We have our prayer meeting every Thursday online from 6 to 7 p.m. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, Almighty God will continue to keep us and let us continue to be online within that period. And the number of the phone is there, which is 712-775-7035, and the access code is there also. Make sure you go on with your booklet. That one will help you to know all the program of the church. And then um, I want to remind you that our convention have been receiving positive things from both all the family. And then, uh, you know, on workers, was it on workers meeting or on the... On the night VG, I was telling you that although the cloud is there, but surely God is going to help us. God really answered our prayer, and I know from the all things I've been receiving, three, the, all the three families are going to be there. Surprisingly, God is a mighty God. And I pray that God will continue to help us in Jesus' name. You can see the power of prayer. We continue to help us in the name of Jesus Christ. I told us if there's anything mysterious that we can't just divine, the only thing is just to lean down beside our bed and call upon the name of the Lord. God, I live unto your hand. You know how to solve it. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we continue to meet us at the point of our need in Jesus' name. The August 5 is the woman program. As they are preparing, let us continue to prepare with them in prayer. By now, I'm expecting the letter to be continue to be prepared and then to start running as maximum from Sunday. I mean minimum from Sunday. Or well, anyone we choose. God will help us in Jesus' name. The same thing Thanksgiving November twenty sixth. You know that one too we start by four o'clock. Let us do all what we can do. As we are doing all what we can do to put Pastor Dada into prayer to present on that day. Because we look at it that this July, I mean, by the time get, let her get to him in July, July, September, October, November, within three months at least, you should be able to plan with us. And then I'm having good news for you that GS is going to be in the convention. It has been well and confirmed. So let every one of us do all what we can do to be in the convention. And then then I think we are going to go on Thursday as scheduled. And then the other family will join us on Saturday or Friday as scheduled. God will continue to help us. Let's go as many as possible. God will help us in this and God will provide. God will surely provide. All what we need just to kneel down and tell him, I want to do this, I want to do it. He knows how to answer it. And then it's going to be on the new convention grant. Brother Stephen, I sent the letter that you should help me to bring the address of the convention. Did you see it? Okay. We will solve that out for the other. We will sort it out. That's not a big problem. God will continue to help us in Jesus' name. If there's any other thing, there's a possibility we we'll receive a visitor from Nigeria on the from August. We are still communicating and have requested that you should bring a letter 
for his pastor that is going to is going to be in the vagina tech uh, but possibly he may use a week with us here before going to vagina tech then possibly maybe like once in a month or there's going to be coming here and then if our dream is come to realization who knows maybe it's the one god is going to use the to start the dsc every day but for the genuity of the um, of the planning and everything at first i should bring the letter from the pastor so that we can show to our regional overseer that at least we have a visitor from nigeria and then we can confirm that the originality of everything so god is going to help us continue to pray that God will bring him his safe journey and by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ our relationship will be godly in the name of Jesus Christ we will not regret any aspect of it in the name of Jesus Christ I've sent the letter to both the bra Ben and the bra Stephen all the communication since we started if there's any other thing I will let us know let us bring our titans often Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray our mighty father we glorify your name we thank you Lord because of the, what you are doing because of what you still continue to do father accept our thanks in Jesus name we are here today we bring our offering let it be acceptable before you in the name of Jesus Christ and let your name be glorified thank you Lord because you are the Lord and answer prayer for those who does not have give to provide for them in Jesus name for those who have but there are still a lot of burden father I pray how to give father you will teach every one of us in jesus name and then in millions fold father because if we don't see sign how can we know that you answer prayer you will reward us in jesus name thank you lord because you are the lord and answer prayer in jesus name we pray as we are putting our offering into the bag let us continue to call upon the name of the lord the father let your name be glorified let your name be glorified. Let's call upon the name of the Lord. That we are going to see God and not human being. His grace is going to be sufficient for us. His mighty hand is going to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. It's time for Bible reading. We shall read from the first first king chapter 10 first king chapter 10 chapter 10 and when the queen of sheba heard of the fame of solomon concerning the name of the lord she came to prove him with hard questions and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy act and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram, that brought gold from Ophir, 
brought in from Ophir great plenty of Elmug trees and precious stones. And the king made of the Elmug trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, harps also, and psalteries for singers. There came no such Elmug trees, nor were seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred threescore and six talents of gold. Beside that he had of the merchantmen, and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia, and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made two hundred targets of beaten gold. Six hundred shekels of gold went to one target. And he made three hundred shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory, and overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other, upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for six hundred shekels of silver, and an horse for an hundred and fifty. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria did they bring them out by their means. Praise the Lord. May God bless his one hour heart in Jesus' name. We shall listen to choir song.
Everybody now will raise up our hands as we pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this glorious night, wonderful night, beautiful night. Thank you, Lord, for all our members, all our ministers, all our pastors, all our leaders, all our teachers, all our workers, everyone, Lord. Thank you for the members and for those who are coming for the first time today. We're praying, Lord, you will open the windows of heaven and shower blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. This day will be a turning point, a turning around. A transformation night for everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody of their heart, take everything away. Concern for husband, concern for wife. Lord, do miracles in every life in Jesus' name. And all those who are in the satellite the locations around here, I pray, Lord, everybody will pay attention. And our lives will be enriched in Jesus' name. All over Lagos City, all over Lagos State, all over Nigeria, all over Africa, everywhere we hear this word tonight, Lord, do something specific, spectacular in every life tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we're reading from verse 28. John chapter 6, verse 28. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? These people have been looking for Jesus. They were searching for Jesus. They were seeking him. And eventually they crossed the river. And he came to the other side. And he your word and sensible in your presence so that lord everything you want to do you will do with every one of us bless us and make us channels of blessing make us disciples indeed that will be able to do what you have a portion for us to do in jesus name we pray 
thank you very much for sitting down now and we're concentrating on the watch of god we're looking at matthew chapter 4 verses 18 through to 22 matthew chapter 4 verse 18 and jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brethren simon called peter and andrew his brother casting a net into the sea and they were fishers that's the best thing that ever, that ever happened to these fishermen this wasn't their first time of going to the seaside they have been at that seaside for a long time and if jesus had not showed up their lives would have remained the same and would have forgotten about them long ago how many other people fished or were fishermen in this same sea at this same shore we've never heard about them the day christ comes to you is the beginning of something to be remembered for the rest of your life and for all eternity jesus came to them what a great privilege the population of that of the world at that time was about 250 million and out of those 250 million jesus said who should i touch where should i go who should i invite who should hear this voice coming from heaven he decided he'll go to the seaside there were better people than Peter and Andrew. There were better people than James and John. The members of the Sanhedrin were there. The political parties were there. The zealots were there. And Jesus said, who will I go to? And then he decided, he saw these people. He saw them before they saw him. He got there before he got there. He had a vision of them before they viewed him. He saw them. He saw their heart. He saw their past. He saw their present. He saw their future. By the way, he first came to Peter. That's Matthew chapter 4. And you'll discover as you read Matthew chapter 10, the least of the disciples, what came first? Peter. You go to Luke, who came first? Peter. You go to Acts, who came first? Peter. The people he first went to, and then Andrew, and then James and John. Look at all the list of those apostles and disciples. Those four always led the team. Anywhere you see the list of those apostles and disciples, you always have Simon and James and John and Andrew. The order may change as you go from chapter to chapter. But the first person is always the first person, Peter, Simon, Peter. What a great privilege when Christ comes to you. What a great privilege in all the bustles and the hustles of life. And Jesus decides, where will I go today? Of the teeming population of this country, of the teeming population of this world, he decides to come to you. And then he passed by which is the best place to go you think about the city the synagogue is there the temple is there the streets are there the palaces are there and the seashore is there and jesus decided it will be at the seashore that he will meet the people do you think this is the best environment you can see in town maybe not but jesus decides this is the place to come and meet you and then in verse 19 he says unto them there wasn't even a long message there wasn't any kind of motivation there wasn't any kind of pleading he just said unto them follow me you followed your mind until this time you followed a cut out vision a personal ambition until this time you followed a professional trade until this time you follow the religion until this time now follow me those two powerful words and so hear the words of jesus from heaven and he says follow me and then he said on that condition i will make you fishers they were fishermen already but he said i'll make you fishers of men this whole world like a sea of humanity 
and the many people like the fish lost in the depths of the sea and i've come to call you come and assist me and join hands with me i'll make you fishers of men i'm not sure peter realized i'm not sure you realize what's was brought up in that word make i will make you it's like you know a teacher a professor going to a little child and he says come on come to my class i will make you a medical doctor that little child will not understand it's just a little child maybe in primary one and then this professor comes to their neighbor and says come on give me your hand i will make you a medical doctor or he goes to another vicinity and he says come on he saw these uh, children that are playing the in football in their community and he says follow me i'm a professor i'm an engineer i'm going to make you an engineer now you begin to understand it's a process that that child then will leave the football you have to leave something before you can follow somebody and then they left everything and they followed him andrew what did he tell you i will make you in that making number one there is a melting down you know before you come to christ you're just sure of yourself you're very rigid your mind is rigid your neck is rigid and jesus says i'll melt you down i cannot make you in the position i find you now but i'll melt you down number two i'll mold you it's in that molding that jesus then takes your life he looks at the perfect picture what you ought to be and he looks at the imperfect portrait where you are today and from the imperfect portrait onto the perfect picture he begins the process of men of melting you down and then molding you and then after that it begins to also mend your life after you are born again have you discovered some things in your life that the Lord said, now we're in the process of making. I'm going to mend some things in your life. We'll put this right, we'll put this right, we'll put that right. And then he says, I'll monitor you. You know we have to do that if you're a manufacturer. You have to keep on monitoring and measuring what you're doing. Without the measure and the monitoring, you don't know whether you're going to bring the perfect picture or not. And I'm going to mature you. I'm going to mature you. It's in that process. He melts you down. Then he molds you. And then when he sees anything that is not proper in your life, then he does some, he means you, he keeps on monitoring you until he now matures you. And he says, this is a model. He actually wanted to make them a model of the other disciples that will come after. But he said, there's one thing you are going to do before I can start. Can the teacher teach you before you come to class? Can the can the professor begin the process of making you an engineer a medical doctor before you come to class no you have to leave the playground and you have to come to class and then with a ready mind and with a sharp focus you sit down there, you say, teacher, here I am, professor, here I am, begin the process of making me. That's what Jesus said. He said, follow me. And it is when you carry out that first assignment, then he says, I will make you fishers of men. Don't turn your eyes away from Christ. He's the one that is responsible for making you what you ought to be and then it continues it says in verse 20 and straightway they left their nets and followed him you always have to leave something and it's not always something that is simple and bad you always have to leave something before you can follow christ and before you can follow the professor that wants to make you an engineer a medical doctor a lawyer or whatever you have to leave something back at home I know things to live at home are not necessarily evil. They are not necessarily bad. You have to leave even some friends, some time wasting friends. You leave them behind. I'm going to school. I'm going to college. I'm going to university. I want to be made a fisher of men. 
And so you find these people leaving everything and following the Lord. The question I'm asking you is, number one, have you left anything behind? Yes, I know if you're born again, you have left your sin. But more than that, have you left any other sin behind? Two, are you following Christ? Three, do you see his melting hand? Or do you reject his melting hand? Sometimes the message comes and God uses that message to melt you down, to crumble you down. And then he's trying to mold you into shape. And he's trying to mend your life. And he's trying to mature you into a model. And sometimes it's inconvenient. Have you allowed Jesus to start the process? Of making you, making you a son disciple. And straightway they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from this, he saw all the two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a sheep with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. When Jesus meets you, when he calls you, it's very important. Here we find James and John mending their nets. And as we look at James and John after this time, look at them in the church. They are mending relationships. Look at their epistles. They are mending the lives of those believers. They're not so much into even, even getting people converted. They're looking at the people that are converted already. And John, the apostle of love, is always mending them. The fellowship we have the Father, that's what we're introducing to you, that you may have fellowship with us and fellowship with God. Mending. He met them mending their nets, and then he said, come on, you can mend something more than a net. You can mend something more than an instrument for fishermen. You can mend something within the kingdom. Is God talking to you today to mend relationships and to mend, you know, the lives of people? He wants to do it for them, but he wants to use you when he meets you. And then he says to these same people, he said unto them, follow me. And then what did they do in verse 22? And they immediately led, immediately led, time is precious, immediately. If we say, maybe I'll decide tomorrow. You, you've lost 24 hours already. What you could do, what Christ in 24 hours. If you say, I'll do it next week. You've lost a whole week already, immediately. You see, we, uh, somebody, some people say decide today because uh, who knows you may die today. Well, that's one part of the story. But who knows you might lose a great opportunity of doing something spectacular for the Lord if you delay immediately when the Lord calls you. He sets the time and he knows what you're supposed to do. He has a great work for you to do and something very essential, very important. And he says, I'm calling you now. Don't lose a minute. A minute is very, very precious in the work of the Lord. The opportunities you have, the privileges you have. And then it says over here, immediately in verse 22, they led the sheep and their father that wasn't sin their father was not a sin we had to leave their father you know we have some attachments and some affection and sometimes those affections will, will tie us down and our father will not be able to go with us mommy will not be able to go with us and in fact if you're going to be a medical doctor if you're going to go to the law school you have to leave your father behind daddy will not follow you to class Mommy will not follow you to class. Brothers and sisters, uh, siblings will not follow you to class. There's some things we have to leave behind. There's some people we have to leave behind. We just have to make up our mind. If you're now a man, if you're now a woman, if you're not matured, mature to go to school, mature to walk alone, mature to take a decision. They, they were matured enough to take a decision. They left their father behind. Are you mommy's daughter? Daddy's boy? You cannot take a decision without daddy, without mommy. You cannot leave anybody or anything behind. You're still a child. You're still a baby. But these were adult people. They said, daddy, bye-bye. The Lord is calling. 
bye bye something great is coming and we're following on and you all follow the call of a true disciple that's what disciple that means a learner a learner put that down it's a learner from being a learner it's going to make them a light from being a light it's going to make them a leader and this is just the beginning he said follow me you'll be my disciple you'll be a learner and then not too far from here he said yeah the light of the world he made them light and not too far from now he made them leaders feed my sheep you begin by being a disciple you end up by being an apostle we're going to divide the message to three parts number one caution against theoretical discipleship caution against theoretical discipleship number two condition of true discipleship the condition of true discipleship number three the character of trusted disciples the character of trusted disciples let's come to number one caution against theoretical discipleship if you're a science student you know what we call theory you know sometimes we'll pick up a science book and in the very first chapter you know the the writer the author wants to make you understand uh, this is untested ground unproving ground it says these are theories and it says in fact this theory is not proven yet there are some missing links before we can take a final decision yes we've gone to the lab and we've done everything we ought to do but this is still this is still theory yeah but you know something that surprises us in those books is that by the time you come to chapter three and chapter four is building on that theory as if that was a fact and I'm saying, Professor, wait a minute. You told me in chapter one, this is just theory. And now in chapter four, you are building on it and making some conclusions, some sweeping conclusions, as if this is a fact already. That's what those who teach evolution, that's what they do. The theory of evolution. It's not the fact of evolution. It's a theory. And then when they are told that this is a theory, and there are some missing links were still trying to wrestle with. By the time they come to their pictures and everything, at the almost at the end of the book, they're they are telling us now this is that. I say, but you told me in chapter one, this is only theory. They are theoretical disciples, and the Lord is cautioning us, and He's telling us, don't take the theoretical people, theoretical disciples, as if they were true disciples. Let's look at them one by one in um, John chapter 2. John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, you would have said those are real disciples. They saw his miracles and they believed. And then in verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He did not commit himself unto them. He did not rely on them. He did not lean on them. He did not commit anything into their hands. And needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Remember once again, a disciple is a learner. What kind of disciples are these? Number one, counterfeit learners. Counterfeit learners, not dependable, not trustworthy. You couldn't lean on them. They were counterfeit learners. And we're looking at chapter 6 of John. Chapter 6 of John, I'm reading from verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14 says... That's John chapter 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, the prophet that shall come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and make him and take him by force, and to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Can you think of Christ running away from a true disciple? Never. But he ran away from these people. They wanted to make him a king. And then Jesus ran away from them. And look at it now from verse 24. In verse 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, 
neither his disciples. They also took sheep in and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves, and ye were filled. Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto life everlasting which the son of man shall give unto you for him as god the father sealed you see these people they were not for real they thought they were looking for jesus and you would have thought they were disciples but jesus said there are theoretical disciples and you cannot lean on them you cannot depend on them in chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 60. verse 60 says Many therefore of his disciples, many therefore of those learners, when they heard, when they had heard this, they said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? In verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many of his disciples of those learners, they went back. It's not as we thought. What he's saying is not what I expected. He's not giving us what we expected. He will give. Number two, covetous learners. Number one, you have the counterfeit learners. Number two, you have the covetous learners. Number three, you have the carnal learners. Just carnal. They were just looking for the things of this world. And then I come to chapter 8 of Matthew Matthew chapter 8 in Matthew chapter 8 we're reading from verse 21 Matthew chapter 8 verse 21 and another of his disciples said unto him Lord suffer me first to go and bury my father one of his disciples said Lord I'm hearing you Lord I want to be a learner of course I want to follow you but me first the Lord second me first your will second me first your demand on my life after let me go first bury my father the traditional things are more important than the spiritual things in his mind you know there are people like that they claim to be Christians but it's me first my ambition first my will first our tradition first our family religion first Give me the first place and then Jesus can take any other place you want. That's no discipleship. And here we have this man, as he said, that me first, let me go first and, you know, bury my father. Here is what Jesus said in verse 22. Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Let the dead bury their dead. You don't have to be a disciple before the, you'll bury the dead. You don't need grace before you'll bury the dead. You don't need the spirit of God before you'll bury the dead. You don't need eternal life before you'll bury the dead. There are many dead people there without God, without Christ, without eternal life, without the spirit of God, and without the power of the because in their lives. They can bury the dead. Let them do that. Don't do the work of the dead. I'm calling you to life. Here is the prince of life. I'm calling you. Let the dead bury the dead. You come and preach the kingdom. We never hear anything about that man again. And we're looking at um, Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 16. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they knew God, they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. They profess that they know God, 
these are the people that say i'm a disciple to you i'm a learner to you are you getting the point of these theoretical disciples number one counterfeit learners number two covetous learners number three carnal learners number four corrupt learners i'm sure you've heard of judas Iscariot. he thought he was one of them and the rest of the people thought he was one of them and when jesus said one of you will betray me nobody could ever guess that judas Iscariot was the man a covetous learner a corrupt learner but you know he was not for real one counterfeit two covetous three carnal four corrupt five conceited learner conceited learner they're full of themselves and you have to empty yourself of what you are full of before the lord will fill you conceited learners proud learners number six contentious learners they argue with the professor why did you come to school if you already knew it they argue with christ why did you come to church if you already knew the message they argue with the preachers why did you come to the conference if you already knew everything if you are mr know it all miss know it all mrs know it all why did you come contentious learners and then number seven condemned castaway learners they end up where Judas Iscariot ended up. Condemned learners, cast away learners. I pray you will not be like that. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. And you know, as you read your Bible, you find these people. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts, chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, shop, they came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Finding certain disciples. Finding certain disciples. Think about this. These were disciples. That's what they said. That's what people called them that's what they called themselves finding certain disciples and he said unto them have you received the holy ghost since you believed he looked at their lives and he couldn't find the fruit of the spirit and he began to wonder have you received the holy ghost since you believed he looked at their lives he was meeting them for the first time and he said we are disciples too and he couldn't find the comfort of the holy spirit the holy spirit is a comforter they were full of complaining and murmuring and he said have you received the holy ghost since you believe and then this and they said unto him we have not so much as heard whether there be any holy ghost i see i understand your problem now we have never heard whether there be any holy ghost and he said unto them, Unto what then are ye were ye baptized? And he said unto John's baptism, Can that be right? Unto John's baptism, we've been following John. I'm not sure you have followed John properly. Number one, John was filled of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And you've never heard of the Holy Ghost? and john had the holy ghost the spirit of elijah he will move on in the power and the spirit of elijah and you have never heard of the holy ghost and john's mother was filled with the holy ghost and you have never heard of the holy ghost and zechariah the father of john was filled with the holy ghost and disciples in quotes you've never heard of the holy ghost and john said i come here baptizing you with water there is one coming after me he will baptize you of the holy ghost and with fire and you have never heard of the holy ghost what kind of disciples are you were you paying 
paying attention here comes jesus he was baptized in river jordan and while he was coming out of the water there was a voice of the father from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased and the holy ghost like a dove rested on him and you have never heard of the holy ghost and john said i never knew him but he that sent me baptized him said on whom you see the holy ghost descending he is the one and you have never heard of the holy ghost what kind of disciples are you they were not paying attention if you pay attention to john you'll hear of the holy ghost you will see the holy ghost moving in his life but these disciples said we never heard we never heard maybe you are always absent from class that's why you never heard maybe you are there but your mind is not there that's why you've never heard and then but thank god there's always a possibility of you having what you have missed you'll have it today and the power of god the holy ghost will come in your life in jesus name but you see these were not disciples for real that's the point i'm making they call themselves disciples other people call them disciples beware of theoretical disciples i go to point number two the condition of true discipleship condition of true discipleship we're looking at matthew chapter 18. matthew chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 1. this and at the same time came the disciples unto jesus saying who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said verily i say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven he said except ye be converted notice that discipleship demands conversion we cannot just continue the way we have always been doing the things we have always done dressing the way we have always dressed drinking what we have always drunk mixing with the crowd we have always mixed with and then say we're disciples there must be a conversion there must be a change in um, acts of the apostles chapter 3 acts chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord there's a refreshing there is a renewal if we're going to be real disciples and then in verse 26 unto you first god having raised up his son jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities turning away every one of you from his iniquities you see that there is a turning there's a transformation there is a change there is a movement discipleship sets you in motion you cannot remain static wherever you have always been standing there staying there no motion you've been in darkness before you're still in darkness there's nothing that propels you and moves you and throws you out of that place into a new place and then you say you're a disciple no discipleship sets you in motion to move away from where you have been to where you ought to be and there is a past that is different totally from the present in first corinthians chapter 6 first corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor the effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor reviners nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of god and such were past tense such were some of you but ye are present tense washed that's discipleship you are dirty but now you're clean you are corrupt but now you are upright you are in darkness but now you are in the light 
there is this turning around there is this change that's what that's what brings us to the understanding of discipleship in john chapter 8 john chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 30 as i speak these words many believed on him then said jesus to so those jews would believe on him if he continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed if ye continue it's something to start it's another thing to continue you know there are some temporary disciples they are not true disciples they are temporary they're just there today and tomorrow you cannot find them when they go in get tall when the storm comes on when the fire starts burning when the persecution descends on them when the professors and the lecturer challenge them and when they demand from them of something that a disciple of christ should not go near when the pressure comes they don't know what to do that they are temporarily today tomorrow you cannot find them jesus said if you continue in the pressure in the storm in the flame in the flood in the difficulties in the challenges if you continue in my word and you're not seeking an easy way out and you bear the cross of the disciples it says then are you my disciples indeed as you put all this together what do you find number one convinced convicted learners those are disciples it starts with conviction you hear the word of God and say, I must make a change. I'm convinced. There must be a turning around. I'm convicted of what I've been, what I've done, where I've been. There is the convinced, convicted learner. Number two, the converted learner. You know, just being convinced is not enough. There are many people that are convinced that smoking is bad. Not that they have let smoking, but they're just convinced. The people that are convicted that immorality will bring HIV, they are just convicted, not that they have changed. Number one, convinced, convicted learners. Number two, converted learners. They have been converted. They are turned around. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Number three, cleansed learners you are washed you are clean through the word which has spoken unto you cleansed learners number three conquered crucified learners self is crucified and conquered not my will thine be done the stubbornness of the heart is crucified and conquered not as i will but as thou wilt self will stiff neckness that is the stiff neck i will always do what i've always done i will say what i've always said i will act the way i've always acted that kind of self will is broken for a true disciple and there's a conquered learner i am conquered i cannot say what i used to say I cannot go where I used to go. I cannot be rigid where I used to be rigid. I cannot act the way I used to act. If you're still rigid, stubborn, self-willed, stiff necked you're not a disciple of Christ. But he's inviting you, he's saying, come, I'll melt you down when you are melted there is this fire of the furnace that melts your will and say lord i surrender conquered crucified learner number five consecrated learner now i commit everything to you lord you died for me and with those judge that if one died for all then were all dead I'm dead to personal opinion. 
I'm dead to personal ambition. I am dead to the things I used to say I must do this. And now I'm committed, consecrated, devoted, surrendered unto you. Number six, consistent, constant learners. Lord, I don't know it all yet. Teach me more. Lead me on. More about Jesus, let me learn. More, more of his will to discern. I want to know more of his will, more of his word, more of his wisdom. Constant learner, consistent learners. And you know, all these disciples of Jesus, every time Jesus was preaching, they were always there. They had it yesterday, they want to hear it again. Consistent learners. They learned it before, they want to learn it again. Jesus is saying the same thing he said in Matthew. Now he's saying it in Mark, they want to listen again. He's saying it in Luke, they want to listen again. Now he's saying it in John, they want to listen again. He now comes to Revelation, he said it before, he's going to say it again. They want to listen again. Consistent, consistent, constant learners. Not the people that say, well, I've had enough. I'm saturated. My brain is tired. My mind is tired. I'm filled. I cannot take any word anymore. Those are not disciples. Disciples are consistent, constant learners. They say, Lord, teach me more. Give me this bread of life evermore. Give me this bread. I want more of it. Those are the disciples. There's a desire. There's a passion in their heart. They want more and more and more. Number seven, Christ-like learners. Christ like uh, the, the reason why he calls you and he wants to make you official of men is to reproduce himself in you. He that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do, and greater works than this shall he do, because I go to the Father. He wants to reproduce himself in you. Number one, convinced, convicted learners. Number two, converted learners. Number three, cleansed learners. You are cleansed. The souls, dirty, or trances are no more there. Dirty language, no more there. Dirty behavior, no more there. Shameful behavior, no more there. Shameful association, no more there. Shameful interaction with lecturers, no more there. This is a cleansed disciple, lady. Can I see in the office? Sir, things are different now. The things we used to do. I even wanted to come to, to tell you those dirty things, we cannot do them again. Things are different now. I'm cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And because of that cleansing, no more dirty play. No more dirty interaction. Cleansed. Cleansed learners conquered learners and you know when somebody is conquered you know uh, when when soldiers go to the battlefield and they take one of the enemy soldiers and they conquer him by his look by his posture you can tell he's conquered his will is conquered it's not in a fighting posture anymore it's, it's in a submissive posture What's your posture? What's your demeanor? What's your attitude? What do we see of you? Is there something in you that is still standing up opposed to the watch of God? Or are you the conquered, crucified learner? Consecrated? We have to beg you before you serve God. We have to plead with you before you do what you ought to do. Where is the consecration? Consecrated learners, consistent, constant, always there, always abiding in the Lord. Christ-like learners. I pray God will do it for you. I come to point number three, the character of trusted disciples. The character of trusted disciples and there are some people that call themselves disciples you cannot trust them if you lean on them you're already signing your own disappointment paper you cannot trust them 
They give a lot of promises in prayer. During the conference, you cannot trust them. It appears they have skill, capability, ability, but you cannot trust them to use those skills for the expansion of the kingdom. You cannot trust them. They seem to have a kind of promising future. We'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. We're not just ordinary Christians. We're campus Christians. And we're people. We know this. We know that. And you know, when I go for you service, I'm going to do this and that. It's all empty air. Coming out of an empty stomach. You cannot trust them. But there are some people, they don't say much. They just go on their knees and they say, Lord, just one life. And this single life, I'm going to spend it to the glory of your name for the expansion of the kingdom. And God says, yes, I trust him. What are the characteristics of those people? How do you know them? And what do you really need to have so that you'll be a trusted disciple? The character, the characteristics of trusted disciples. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 1. Acts 16 verse 1, then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple, notice that a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, that's Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. His father was a Greek, but the mother was a Jewess. And that means that on the one side, he had the heritage of the Jews. On the other side, he had the tradition of the Gentiles, Greek. And now he became a disciple, a believer. He had believed. And here is what we learn about him, which was well reported of by the brethren. Well reported of by the brethren. Paul came to town. And then he saw this disciple, he had never met him before. And as, as Paul, the apostle, saw him, the man had been converted, born again already. And then Paul wanted to take him. They said, that's the man, that's the man you should take and develop. A man you should take and train. A man you should take and just, and just reproduce yourself in that man. It's a good man. Everybody reported well of him. A trusted disciple trusted disciple trusted disciple how much can we trust you how much can we trust you when you're on the campus how much can we trust you how much can we trust you when the exam is coming and you're, and you're throwing all these papers around have you seen it have you seen it how much can we trust you how much can we trust you when the lecturer calls uh, for a night class? And then he says, well, this is going to be a tough exam. And uh, you people, you better shape up and you better sit up. And all these holy, holy ladies, you know, in this class, you better shape up. Because, uh, you know, to get certificate out of this place, anyway, you, you already know. Because I don't say we don't have to tell you everything, all the details. You know what to do. How much can we trust you? When you are going on holidays, and Mr. So and so is going to have a birthday party. Where will your conviction stand? How much can we trust you? That you say you are a Christian, you are a disciple, you are a learner, a committed learner. And now, when what you have learned is going to be called in question and going to be put in the balances, how much can we trust you? When a friend, a good friend, a close friend, an intimate friend decides, you know, my friend, it's like I, you know, I thought I would, you know, be a Christian for the rest of my life, but it's like my mind is changing. I, I don't want to leave the church without telling you I'm leaving. I just want to tell you I'm fed up. I can, you know, sit down, stand up, bend down, pray, close your eyes, open your eyes, raise up your hand, put down your hand. It's too much for me. How much can we trust you at that time? When the people that were your friends 
when they when they're going when they're going away and they say i'm sorry i cannot go on anymore how much can we trust you but Timothy was well recommended by all the people. They said, Paul, and we, we know you'll be disappointed by people. Your Demas is there, Alexander is there, and the other people are there. But this one, you can trust this one. And he proved himself trustworthy. I pray you'll prove yourself trustworthy. But you know, there was a test. There was a test. This man had been a believer. And Paul, the apostle, saw him and he said, and they say you're a believer. Yes, I am. All right, now let's do something here. In chapter 16, verse 3, he would, Paul, have to go forth with him. What a test. You're a disciple? Yes. You'll go anywhere with Christ? Yes. You'll, you'll do anything for Christ? Yes. All right, I want you to go along with me. Where will you be going? I don't know. The Spirit will lead me. What will happen to us there? I don't know what will happen. The other day they stoned me. The other day I had a shipwreck. And the other day I had some mob wanting to just tear me to pieces. But you'll follow me. And he followed as a trusted disciple. When you put your future in the hand of the Almighty God. Well, so I don't care what happens to Paul. He's my mentor. He's going to be my father in the Lord. And I'm going to follow along. Whatever happens. And, and they were told. And he took and circumcised him. He wasn't a little boy. The pain of circumcision. And at that time, and there were all these anesthetics. They, what they do in medical science. That you'll not feel the pain. All that was not there. And he says, uh, you know, the cause of discipleship. If you're going to follow me. I'm saying to the Jews and the Gentiles. And good enough, your mommy is a Jew. And then your daddy is a Gentile. When we go to the Gentiles, they don't worry about circumcision. But you know, Timothy, we're going to reach out to some Jews. And those people, if you are not circumcised, they're not going to accept us. Will you go through the pain of circumcision? As now a young man, Paul, I'll go through anything. I just want to follow you. That's a disciple. I'll go through anything. I'll endure any pain. I'll endure any pressure. That's a disciple. You can trust him. And then we're told in this same chapter 16 verse 3. And then it says, Because the Jews of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which were ordained of the apostles and elders which were Jerusalem. They didn't have a private message of their own. The message coming from the headquarters from Jerusalem, that's the only thing. And, and that's what they gave to the people. You know how I want to be independent? Educated people, university people, college graduates. We have some intelligence, we have some understanding. Can't we cough out our own doctrine? And can't we do some, you know, put some touch on it that will show that this is original? Or are you going to practice plagiarism in a Christianity? Just take what is coming from Jerusalem and then just give it to all the people. That's plagiarism. That's, you know, it's like you want to write an essay, you want to write an article, and then you copy this and copy that. No, we're, we're beyond that. Paul, the apostle, and Timothy were not beyond that. Those who are trusted disciples, they just took what came from their quarters, Jerusalem, and then they gave to all the churches. However, being original, forget it. It, forget it. If you're going to be trustworthy, there is no originality. Christ has given us the doctrine. He has given us the word. And that is what they all gave to the people. And then it says in verse 5, so what the church is establishing the faith and increased in number daily. Let me look at this, uh, Timothy. Trusted disciple. You'll be a trusted disciple. Give me a good amen. Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, trusted disciple, Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading to you there from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 19. It says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus who sent him just shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort 
when I know your state, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that's of Timothy, that as a son, what the Father he has served with me in the gospel. You know him, I know him, everybody knows him. There's a trusted disciple. No originality, no changing of the doctrine. What we got from the headquarters, Jerusalem, were given to all the people. Now, this kind of disciple, what do you know about them? Number one, a changed learner. A changed learner. Learning ought to change us. If learning does not change us, then nothing has happened. It should change our mind. It should change our world view. It should change our concept. It should change our lifestyle. It should change our interest. It should change our ambition. It changed learner. That's a trusted disciple. You see the change that came on Timothy? He was not circumcised before. Now he's circumcised. He was living in Iconium, that just around that little place. Now he's changed and he's following Paul all about. He was a person that planned his own programs before, but Paul is now planning the program for him. And Paul is saying, There's a way to go, that's the way to go. And he's telling the Philippines, the Philippians, I'm going to send Timothy to you. I've not told him yet, but he cannot, he cannot say no. Once I tell him he'll come to you, that man is a changed man, a changed agenda. It changed plan. It changed ambition. It changed plan. That's a changed learner. Number two, a childlike learner. A childlike learner. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. A childlike learner. Not somebody so difficult, so tough, so uncontrollable. So incorrigible, but a chant like learner. Can you see to you? You know, a brother that preached uh, the first uh, message I was talking about stubbornness, stubbornness. I said, We on the campus, stubborn, stubborn. They are wondering how can we be stubborn if we're disciples? Change, chant like number three, chosen chosen learners you have not chosen me but i have chosen you and before the lord could choose them you must have seen some qualities in them are you the kind of person that christ will want to choose for an important work when the delicate work is to be done in the kingdom are you the kind of person that the lord will want to choose when an operation is going to be performed on the body of christ are you the kind of a servant? Some, uh, are you the kind of person that the Lord will want to choose for a delicate operation in the body? Chosen. A chosen learner. John was that kind of person. He could choose. And then Peter and John sent to Samaria. Those were the kinds of people. And Paul the apostle. That, that kind of person that the Lord could choose is a chosen vessel to bear my name, my glory unto the Gentiles. Are you the kind of person when God has a work to do that is special and delicate that he will choose you? A changed learner. A childlike learner. A chosen learner, a cherished learner, cherished learner, the disciple whom Jesus loved, leaning on the bosom of Christ, cherished, cherished. How does the Lord cherish you? I almost you become almost indispensable in the kingdom, and the Lord is saying, I have many disciples, but that one, that one. Was be by my son all the time. He's cherished. You make yourself cherished in the kingdom to the leadership in the campus. Or are the are the leaders just tolerating you? And I just saying, Well, God, give us more patience to accommodate this kind of disciple. Give us more humility to accommodate this kind of disciple. Lord, we cannot throw them away. 
No father will throw away a difficult child, a stubborn child, but God give us grace. And Moses is almost saying, Lord, have I given back to these people? I sit like this. Lord, if you're going to deal with me like this, to lead this kind of people, get me out of this world. Moses did not cherish them, but you know, he cherished somebody that was Joshua. With all the heart aches and the belly aches that Moses had, Joshua was always by his side. And even though Elijah actually wanted to die, when Jezebel was running after him, and Elijah was saying, Oh Lord, I'm not better than any of my fathers, kill me. But he cherished somebody later that was Elisha, pouring water on his son. Are you like that? Cherished learner. That when you are there, the way you learn, and the way you're sinking and soaking the word of God, and the way you abandon yourself to the things of the Lord, you know, uh, the leader is saying, if everybody is like this, Lord, preaching will be easy, ministry will be easy. Number one, a changed learner. Number two, a childlike learner. Number three, a chosen learner. Number four, a cherished learner. Number five, a charitable learner. Charitable. You're full of charity. You're full of good works. You're full of love. And then number six, a chaste learner, chaste, modest, pure, uncontaminated, uncorrupted, chaste learners. Number seven, challenged, challenging learners. These are learners that challenge us. These are learners. When we see their lives, they make us to want to go on and you say, Lord, give me more humility. The way I see this sister, Lord, I need more gentleness. If I can be as gentle as that sister, if I can be as committed as that brother, challenged, challenging learners. Does your life challenge anybody? Or is your life just like so, so light? Just kind of lukewarm, not here, not there, not up, not down, not fiery, but not too cold either. Just moderate. Are you challenging anybody? That's what the Lord is saying. And the Lord is saying, give me your hand. Follow me. And I will make you what you ought to be. And the time has come for you to look at all these possibilities and all these stages of discipleship and learners and to say, Lord, I'm giving myself to you afresh. Start the work again with me. And the Lord is going to make something beautiful out of your life. Would you rise up then and tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I, here am I, here am I, Lord. Do something new and do something fresh so that my life will be the life of a real disciple. Don't be a theoretical disciple. Don't be a theoretical disciple. Only making profession but no possession. Pretending to be, but not really there. Don't be a counterfeit learner, a counterfeit disciple. That the Lord says, I don't know him, I don't know her. Her name is not in my book of life. His name is not in my book of life. Don't be a covetous learner, a covetous disciple like, like Judas Iscariot. Always grudging the people that pour the ointment on Christ. Covetous disciples, carnal disciples, carnal, 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 worldly, earthly, corrupt, corrupt, corrupt language, corrupt posture, corrupt appearance. Appearances that will make you feel corrupt on the inside. Conceited, proud, haughty disciples. Contentious. Always in conflict. Condemned, cast away. Be real. Don't be a counterfeit. Convicted, converted. Cleansed, conquered. Crucified, consecrated. 
consistent, constant. Christ like. Ask yourself every time what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Day by day, you want to be like Christ. Moment by moment, you want to be like Christ. And when you are confronted with any situation, any challenge, any temptation, any trial, you're asking, what would Jesus do? That's what I want to do. A Christ-like disciple. Let him fill your heart with his grace. Let him cleanse your heart with his blood. Let him turn you around and transform you. Let him make such a change in your life. That what you are today will be higher and better and deeper than what you were yesterday. So there's a new life, a new language, a new commitment, a new yieldedness, a new surrender unto the Lord. So you'll not just be like this insipid, lukewarm, tasteless kind of water that he wants to spew you out you want to commit yourself to the Lord Lord turn me around no more a theoretical disciple but a true disciple no more theoretical but true Let the grace be evident. The grace of God. Let godliness be evident. The godly life. Let it be evident in your life. That you know beyond any shadow of doubt. That you have handed over yourself, your life to the Lord. And the Lord has made the necessary change. Now you can say, I'm no more what I used to be. A changed disciple. I don't say what I used to say. A changed disciple. I don't dress, I don't look the way I used to dress, the way I used to look. It changed appearance. I don't mix with the crowd I used to go out with. It changed association. A mighty change. A miraculous change. A change coming through the master's hand. A change. A changed disciple. Changed heart. Changed attitude. Changed behavior. Changed character and conduct. Changed association and interaction. Changed ambition. Now you want to follow the Lord all through your life. A childlike learner, childlike disciple, sought, controllable. No more stubborn, no more self willed, gentle, humble, a chosen disciple that God can trust you so much and choose you to do what you will not choose others to do. 
chosen. Like Paul the Apostle, a chosen vessel. Like Timothy, chosen beyond others, before others, above others. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Have you found out what he chose you for? To be in the kingdom at such a time like this? Chosen. To be in the ministry at such a time as this? Chosen. He cherished disciple. Not somebody you are just tolerating. Are we just tolerating you? Are we just saying, leave him there? Maybe something will change in the future? Are you just being tolerated or are you cherished? A cherished disciple. Look at your heart. Listen to the voice of the spirit within. And I will tell you. Cherished. Charitable. Charitable. Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? If I don't have charity, and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Do I have a faith to move mountains? And I then give my body to be burnt. If I don't have charity, profits me nothing. Do you understand all prophecy and all mysteries of the kingdom? If you don't have charity, you are nothing. Charitable disciple. Charitable. Loving. A new commandment I give unto you. That she love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one towards another, as Christ has loved you, charitable, a charitable disciple. Why don't you tell the Lord he'll plant that charity, that love, the divine love in your heart, to love you with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. A charitable disciple, a chaste disciple, pure, innocent, righteous, holy. A chaste disciple. Paul the Apostle said. I brought you to Christ as a chaste virgin. Chaste. Challenged, challenging disciple. Does the light challenge other people to want to go on, to move on, to serve the Lord better, to go higher, deeper, further, farther in the way of the Lord? Or are you a discouragement to those who want to run? Are you a discouragement to those who want to serve the Lord? Or are you a challenge to them? Does your life motivate other people to want to serve the Lord better? Challenge, challenging disciples make a covenant with the Lord today a commitment to the Lord today you'll be what he wants you to be in Jesus name we pray Amen. and the people of God said Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this call to discipleship. And we thank you because of the clarity of your word today. We are praying, Lord, everything that needs to be done within us so will be the kind of disciple you are really raising up and molding and mending their lives to bring us to maturity. Do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, cleanse everyone wash everyone, purge everyone, purify everyone, that every impurity and iniquity, every hindrance to true discipleship, you'll take away from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray we'll never be the same again. That your life will be reflected in us and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. That will come to that point when people just see us, just listening to us, they want to follow you. We we'll pray, Lord, you upon your spirit now, upon your people, upon your children over here, so that, Lord, what you want to see in us and of us, you will see in everyone in Jesus' Amen. name. Strengthen your people. Amen. That will march on without looking back. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.